Okay. Uh, thanks, Alexei. Um, okay, so I'm going to, uh, although I've got quite a general title, I'm really going to focus on one uh, main case study to try and draw out some of uh, uh, some of the issues around my attempts to understand public space, which, as Alexei Matia has said, is a, a very elusive and, and, and slippery uh, concept. I'm going to be looking at societies in um, mainly in the southern part of, of Scotland. Um, I'll divide the talk into four. I'm going to spend most of the time on the first part, so don't panic that all of the sections are going to be as long as the first part. But basically, I want to first set out um, some ideas around the kind of societies that exist in the Iron Age from around about 800 BC to around about uh, 100 AD in southern Scotland, which I'll be characterising as anarchic societies. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but we're talking about, we could, we could talk about them as heterarchical or segmentary or egalitarian or acephalic, but anarchic is the, the, the term I'm using. And then I want to look at decision making in those societies, how it works, the kinds of spaces it needs, and how those spaces can be ultimately appropriated and changed as society, the societal forms themselves, change. Okay, so the main area that I want to look at is probably the most intensively studied and intensively excavated part of, uh, I think probably of Iron Age Britain actually, but certainly of Iron Age Scotland, and that's the uh, coastal plain of East Lothian, the area uh, near uh, Edinburgh. In fact, Edinburgh is kind of, kind of here. There's a certain amount of built-up area along the coastal fringes, but when you take the built-up area out, you can see that there's an immensely dense landscape of uh, Iron Age settlements. So these are substantial sites. They're large enclosures, um, mostly ploughed out, so we're, we're recognising them as, as crop marks. And basically, wherever there is the potential for settlement, there is settlement. There's a remarkably dense landscape of Iron Age settlement here. It's very much focused on the, the lowlands. As you come into the upland, um, there's a very interesting uh, disappearance of settlement. And this has to be real. And we suspect it's because those uplands are being used by these communities as part of transhuman strategies, uh, taking sheep in particular up into the uh, uplands in the uh, summer, sheep and cattle. Now these... Um, this landscape is a very interesting one in many ways, and one of the ways it's interesting is because it seems to have no evidence whatsoever for any form of settlement hierarchy. Uh, this is a selection of those of plans of those crop marked sites. Uh, you can see that they're very regular in terms of size, uh, in terms of morphology. Not all of these dots on the map are quite as complex as these sites. But when we do know when there are excavations that these multivalley hill forts are revealed to be palimpsests of settlement that's evolved over very long periods of time. And so the suggestion is that these sites are basically all in contemporary occupation and they're changing and evolving, but they are fixed places in the landscape that people are, are living in over time. So this is a typical crop mark. This is one of the few upstanding uh, sites in the region. There are, there, are, there are no, despite these hundreds of settlements, there are no very large settlements. There's not, no, no sites that stand out in terms of size, in terms of morphology. When we excavate, there's no evidence for any houses that are larger than any other houses. They're all broadly the same in terms of size. It's an area devoid of any uh, material wealth that we can identify archaeologically. In terms of individual wealth, there are no rich graves, there are, there's no, uh, there's a, literally a handful of, of, of elaborated objects of, of, of Latin art, for example. Um, so we have this dense clustering of apparently individually autonomous enclosed settlements uh, that exist together as neighbours for many, many centuries. And how, you know, what form of society can that represent? And how does that sustain itself, given the clear need for negotiation, constant negotiation, over time for land and resources. Now the major site that's been excavated with, uh, is the site of Brocksmith, which was dug by uh, Peter Hill in the 1970s, but which uh, my, uh, myself and my team at, at, at the University of Bradford published uh, a few years ago. And the important thing with Brocksmith, were well, many important things with Brocksmith, but one of them was to show that when you take one of these, um, one of these settlements apart, 
that the although the hill fork, the multi-valley hill fork element is just one part of the sequence, what we can see from 158 radiocarbon dates is that you have continuity from around about 650 BC through to around about 80, 150, 100, 150, something like that, when this site and indeed the whole settlement pattern that it's associated with seems to disappear. We'll come to that later. So you have an extraordinary settlement pattern, very dense landscape. Now traditionally, of course, this, many of you will be familiar with, with this, but traditionally uh, we've tended to characterize Iron Age societies as very hierarchical. Uh, J.D. Hill you know, get, <coughs> produced this model, this triangular model of Iron Age society, which he, he characterized in his critique, uh, where you have the bulk of the population down at the bottom, and then you have a smaller group of, of, of nobles or elite, and then the chiefs up at the top. And we can see that in many, many guises, in many publications, and it's all deep, deeply rooted in our interpretations. Uh, now, clearly, the landscape of East Lothian doesn't fit that kind of model at all, and it's, it's not unusual in that. In Iron Age Britain especially, there, there are very few uh, instances of uh, settlement distributions uh, that, we can, that we can fit into this kind of triangular model. And so, you know, in terms of that kind of thinking, uh, J.D. Hill suggested, you know, we should be talking about other kinds of models that aren't triangular, and where actually the, the hierarchies, if they exist at all, are much flatter. Um, so we can talk about these in, 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 in different ways, but one of the, a useful way of thinking about them, I think, is to think of them as anarchic societies. We could just call them egalitarian, but that, that sort of undermines the complexity of these societies. When we think of egalitarian societies, we tend to think of them as being very simple, very fluid. But these are societies that have to be complex. They have to have uh, clear uh, rules. They have to have clear interactions to maintain this kind of complexity over periods of time. So by our anarch anarchic societies, what I mean is essentially societies that lack institutionalized leadership, that lack government. It's clearly, we're not talking about anarchy as a, as a, in a sort of modern glib sense, I guess, as a sort of synonym for chaos and disorder, but clearly to maintain the viability of these communities over many, many centuries um, with substantial populations in close proximity, like all anarchic societies, they need powerful social mechanisms to avoid the emergence of inequality and to prevent uh, exploitation between these different societies. They have to have social mechanisms that prevent self-aggrandizement, uh, the emergence of coercive relationships. And that all means negotiation and decision making. Now, homing in into some of the detail of that settlement pattern, I want to just look at the little area around Brocksmith Hillfort itself. So here's Brocksmith. The other numbers are other major hillforts of the same period. One of the things we know from Brocksmith is that um, the community had a mixed farming economy, and uh, we suspect very strongly that they were involved in transhumans, taking animals into the uplands. Now, if you, as soon as you start moving from Brocksmith, within a few kilometers, you've hit another one of these big settlements. If you want to take your animals <coughs> up into the uplands, you're going through presumably territories associated with this hill fort, this hill fort, there are others up here. So you need, you have daily encounters, you're moving through the landscape. All of, these, all of these relationships have to be carefully negotiated. Although these communities are fairly substantial, perhaps a few hundred people, they're not self-sufficient biologically. Marriage partners have to be exchanged. And, then, and we have to envisage that kinship relationships between these communities will be very complex and will cross-cut residential communities. So where do we look in a dense um, settlement pattern like this for the public spaces in which these kinds of, of decisions were made and these kind of corporate um, issues were, were, were raised? Um, we can think about some of the spaces that have been talked about already, like route ways within the landscape, farming in the fields, maybe uh, ritual or religious centers. This is a landscape that doesn't have, as far as we know, large cemeteries, it has no tumuli, there's no option for that kind of uh, location. But what we can see, perhaps, are the delineation of formal public spaces. And that raises the question of the, 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 the site I had on the, the, the cover slide, the site of Traprain Law. Now, Traprain Law, paradoxically, I guess, is you know, one of the best known 
uh, Iron Age sites in Scotland, but in fact for most of the Iron Age, most of the pre-Roman Iron Age, the Prain Law appears to have no uh, settlement of any kind at all. It's a site where I've been excavating with um, some colleagues in, in, in Scotland uh, for, for, for a few years. And one of the things that's become very clear is that Traprain Law was an exceptionally dense settlement in the Late Bronze Age, from around about 900 to 800 BC. Dense settlement, lots of evidence for material wealth, metalwork production, ritual activity in the form of rock art. But from the radiocarbon dates, you can see that there's a complete cutoff, basically around about 800 BC. This then is the period when that dense, anarchic landscape emerges. We move from a very conventional, hierarchical, late Bronze Age chieftain kind of situation into something very different. But there's a little date up there in the Iron Age, and there are a couple of others as well. And what they relate to is something quite specific. The ramparts around the base of Traprate Law, you can't really see them on this fuzzy slide, but they kind of run around here. I'll show you a plan in a second do in fact produce Middle Iron Age dates. They do seem to relate to the same period as Brocksmith and these other sites. But in Site of Prain Law, there's no evidence of any settlement, there's no evidence of any artifactual material from that period. Yet the site's built on a massive scale. These, th these, are, these are the sizes of all the hill forts on that distribution plan. These are two, the two Iron Age phases at Traprain Law. So it's, it stands out as something completely different it's a major marker point in the physical landscape, and yet it seems to be involved the construction of ramparts around essentially an empty, but, but presumably historically, culturally important, mythologically important place. The ramparts that we see constructed are interesting. They're not um, conventionally defensive. There are several pairs of entrances, uh, more than would seem to be functionally necessary. This whole area of the site has been destroyed, so it may be that there were, these were parts of pairs as well. So you seem to have this site where these uh, massive enclosures are built around an essentially empty hilltop, and these multiple entrances invite people in. If we look at other very large hill forts in eastern Scotland, we see something similar happening. This is the, the Brown Catterton in Angus in eastern Scotland. Again, quite a bit of excavation showing this site to be essentially completely empty despite its size. But if we look at the entrances, we can see it's constructed in this very peculiar way that seems to invite and draw people in from that much broader landscape. And we can pick out other examples from around the country as well. So we seem to be starting to see this pervasive pattern of dense uh, settlements of essentially autonomous units with these public publicly defined corporate monuments uh, situated within them. Now one of the things I think that's most compelling about the idea of Trepray as a public space during the Iron Age is what happens to it later. We've seen that before the Iron Age it was a dense, rich settlement apparently at the top of some kind of hierarchical uh, pyramidal structure and at the end of the period exactly the same thing happens again. Sites like Brocksmith are abandoned sometime around the beginning of the Roman period, around about 100 AD in southern Scotland. That whole settlement pattern fades out, disappears. What happens is Traprain Law suddenly is reoccupied, and then once again, as in the late Bronze Age, we see a dense settlement, lots of evidence for material wealth, a major power centre. So I'd suggest that the complex biography of a site like Traprain Law is actually reflecting something much, much wider a shift which, uh, for another time and place, I think maybe reflects something much wider in European prehistory of a, sh a shift from a hierarchical to an anarchic society and back to a hierarchical society again. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>